All right. Hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, you're here for the Empowering Communities to Endure Climate Disasters. I'm really excited to have this discussion today. We know some folks are just trickling in on Zoom. Um, and while everybody's logging in, I just wanted to welcome you all. Thank you so much for making time to join this conversation. Uh, my name is Francesca Fionda. I'm a journalist and moderator for today's event. I'm so excited to walk you through what the next hour and a half will look like and introduce our amazing panelists. But before I do that, I'd like to share some housekeeping and context for what led to this event. Um, over the last year, I've been reporting on climate disasters for the TAI, funded by the Lieutenant Governor's BC Journalism Fellowship. In our multi-series investigation, we uncovered so much about the experiences of people who are being evacuated because of floods and fires. We did a data analysis that showed people are being evacuated for weeks at a time, not just days. We delved into some of the communities most affected by evacuations. Indigenous communities in BC are approximately four times more likely to be evacuated than non-Indigenous communities. And Indigenous people living on reserves across Canada are 18 times more likely to be displaced, according to the federal government. But the data confirmed what many already know that the ongoing colonial legacy of racist policies like how and where reserves were structured and the uneven distribution of resources means that Indigenous communities are more likely to be harmed by climate disasters and displacement. So with that in mind, I welcome everyone to say hello in the chat and share why you've joined today and acknowledge what territory you are joining from. If you're unsure, you can find a resource in the chat to help you. We'll be placing that in the chat right now, and you'll be able to see a link. Uh, myself, I'm a first-generation settler of mixed Filipino and Italian ancestry. I normally work, teach, and live on the stolen homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, uh, but today I'm joining you from Comox First Nation territory on what is known today as Hornby Island. So thank you for taking the time to write in the chat and acknowledge the territories you're joining us from today. I see some, some folks already uh, entering that in the chat. So thank you and, and feel free to do that as you join our conversation. Our TAI series, uh, Bracing for Disasters, has rolled out over the last few weeks. Over nine different articles and 11 firsthand accounts, we shared some of the challenges communities and individuals are facing when they're forced to evacuate from their homes from the threat of fires or floods. If you haven't read those series yet, uh, we're, we'll share a link in the chat now, and we're hoping today that we can have a discussion focused on solutions and ideas for how to address the growing threat of climate disasters. You know, this isn't anything new, but it is getting worse, and we have a lot to learn from people who have survived and are working in this field. We have four guests, and I'm excited to introduce you to them in a moment. And thank you to, to all the folks rolling in with their um, hellos and, and, and uh, land acknowledgements. Thank you for doing that. And you know, as you're entering information in the chat, uh, just a reminder that we do want this to be a discussion. And so I invite you all to share your ideas, experiences in the chat. Uh, we're also opening up a Q&A so you can send in your questions and vote for which questions you want uh, me to ask our guests. This event will also be recorded for later and posted on the SFU Public Square website. Um, and on that note, I'd like to uh, remind you of some of the community guidelines that uh, were posted on our event page. These full guidelines, the, the full guidelines will also be shared in the chat, so you can take a, a look at the link there and also on the slides right now. Um, in short, we expect respect from all participants as well as respect for our community guidelines. There's a zero tolerance policy for violent language, discrimination, and harmful or hateful speech, and anyone who does not follow these guidelines will be removed at the uh, discretion of the event hosts. And you might have seen a sneak peek of one of the slides there. We also have auto-generated closed captioning available uh, via Zoom. You can access it by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and if you need help at any time, please feel free to privately message. Uh, you'll see like a drop down hosts and panelists option in the chat. They'll be there to, to help you out and navigate our online space today. All right, so that's some of the some of the housekeeping. This webinar was uh, and and the series was made possible thanks to a lot of different organizations, uh, the nonprofit newsroom, the Taii, 
the Climate Disaster Project, which led trauma-informed interviews for the series, and SFU Public Square, who put on this webinar. It's also thanks to a generous grant from the Lieutenant Governor's Office that I was able to report on this topic and meet so many amazing climate disaster survivors. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Janet Austin, who was sworn in as the 30th Lieutenant Governor of British Columbia in 2018. Before her current appointment, she spent 15 years as the Chief Executive Officer of YWCA Metro Vancouver. Her honor as Chancellor of the Order of British Columbia and was invested as a member of the order in 2016. And she's identified three key themes for her mandate, the promotion of diversity and inclusion, democracy and civic engagement and reconciliation. Thank you so much for joining us and, and welcome to the conversation. Um, thank you, Francesca, and good morning, friends. I'm speaking to you today from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen peoples, the Songhees and Esquimalt, whom I thank for sharing these lands in peace and friendship. Good day, friends. It's wonderful to be among you today. And I do mean that so, so very sincerely. Um, I will take just a brief moment to comment on the practice of land acknowledgement because I think it's really important. And um, I'm proud to see that it's been adopted broadly across British Columbia and indeed across the country. But it's important that it be more than just a pro forma statement. So as a seventh generation Canadian whose ancestors came uh, to Cape Breton, Nova Scotia during the Scottish clearances, um, when their lands were taken away by the aristocracy, I note that they found a great deal of success and happiness here in Canada, and that is success that I have subsequently benefited from. Um, but I recognize that it's been at the expense of Indigenous peoples. And so for that reason, and because I hold the privilege of serving as Lieutenant Governor, I feel um, a deep responsibility to be a visible and a vocal advocate for reconciliation in all its dimensions and to use these acknowledgements as opportunities to reflect on the legacy of colonialism, the harms of the past, and what I can do in my personal life and in my professional role to contribute to the healing that's needed in Canada. I wanna start my comments by thanking Francesca Fionda for her work in bringing focus and profile to the human cost of the climate crisis, undeniably the greatest existential threat facing humanity today, and, and bringing this profile through the stories of survivors of BC's climate disasters. I'm truly honored to be in a position to support high quality long form journalism on critical public interest topics like this one through the Lieutenant Governor's Journalism Fellowship. And I was delighted when our jury selected Francesca's proposal to receive the first fellowship. And I'm absolutely thrilled with the results so far. Um, very early in my career, way back in the 1980s, I was involved in, in some of Canada's first environmental education and action initi initiatives. Um, things like the first curbside recycling and community composting programs, collection of paper, used tires, batteries, machine and domestic oil products. I helped to promote act, active transportation, organic gardening, planned Earth Day, many other things. That was at a time when there was very little awareness about the importance of climate and hardly anyone talked about climate change because people weren't seeing the direct impacts. But now we're feeling the direct consequences in the extreme weather events of recent years. And it's shocking to me to think that more than 600 British Columbians lost their lives in the heat dome of 2021, followed of course by the raging wildfires, the extreme storms and flooding that devastated critical infrastructure and laid waste to farmland and agricultural operations. In the North, where Canada has 25% of the world's susceptible territory, climate heating is causing permafrost thaw, a powerful change accelerant that unmitigated could push the global climate system past a critical tipping point much earlier than we might otherwise expect. Greta Thunberg was right when she told us, if we do not act now, then almost no other question is going to matter in the future. We know we have only a limited time to cut global emissions and avoid the worst effects of climate change, but we cannot allow ourselves to be paralyzed by the complexity and magnitude of the issues. Since time immemorial, Indigenous peoples have been faithful stewards of our lands and waters, 
yet now they are the most gravely affected and thank heavens for their determination to preserve their culture and the wisdom of their elders, for it is their traditional knowledge that will help us to find solutions. Conversations like the one we have today give us the chance to learn from each other, to find our own ways to contribute to the solutions. But we must also move beyond our own networks and spheres of influence and reach out to those whose views are different from our own. To listen with curiosity and openness and to engage deeply and constructively on those challenging questions of ownership and use of land and resources. It's not too late to seek a better way, to see beyond the horizon of our own experience and to find those places of compromise and common ground in between the extremes of public opinion. And that way will surely be through speaking and listening, through caring and sharing and hearing and really, really learning. Now is the time to remind ourselves that the future is not something we passively enter, it is something we create. <clears throat> and finally, I offer my heartfelt thanks to Janet Weber and her colleagues at SFU Public Square for creating a space where big ideas can be pursued and bold initiatives embraced. A place where students are inspired to take their place in society as citizens who share responsibility for each other, for our communities and for our planet. Thanks also to the TAI for supporting and amplifying Francesca's work and for your commitment to high quality, credible, long form content, which brings depth and focus to the public discourse on many critical issues. I know it isn't easy in this time of radical restructuring of traditional media, but we need your professionalism and integrity in the fight for democracy and for the planet. And finally, to Francesca and all your hardworking, truth-seeking colleagues in journalism, thank you for hanging in despite all the change and uncertainty in your chosen profession. And never doubt how very much your work is appreciated. You keep us informed, you hold power to account, you challenge our thinking, often when we least want it, but most need it. You are guardians of democracy, and I salute you. Haichika Siam. Thank you so much. And uh, a lot of uh, conversation there and, and notes about solutions and the future being something that we create. And the panelists that we've gathered here today are, are very much uh, creating that future. And it is because of conversations uh, with them that uh, we've been able to highlight some of the ways forward. So um, thank you so much. And, and, and my pleasure to introduce uh, our speakers for our conversation today. Uh, we have Tyrone McNeil, who's the chair of the Emergency Planning Secretariat, Stolo Tribal Council President and Tribal Chief, and a member of Seabird Island Band. Uh, the Emergency Planning Secretariat supports 31 First Nation communities to improve emergency planning and preparedness at both local and regional levels. We also have Michelle Feist, who escaped the Litton Fire of 2021. She's a retired mental health nurse who remains connected with the people and uh, her neighbors she had in Lytton. And she shared her powerful firsthand ac account of uh, her evacuation in our series uh, through an As Told To story. We have Tarina College, uh, who's the secretary of the British Columbia Association of Emergency Managers. She has over 15 years of experience working on public safety with local government and was heavily involved in the response operations and recovery planning of the wildfire in Fort McMurray, which she and her family also evacuated from. And Susan Dobra is a published writer and community advocate. She lived in Paradise, California in 2018 during the Camp Wildfire. Today, Susan lives just outside of Paradise, and we're going to hear a little bit about their journey towards rebuilding. She's part of several community-led initiatives to help her community come back from that fire. So thank you, everyone, for joining us, to our panelists as well. Uh, we're going to jump into the conversation here, and I'll remind everyone that as we do, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A for our panelists. We'll be starting our discussion to talk a little bit about how we can prepare and mitigate for disasters, both from a community and individual perspective. Um, and Tyrone, I wanted to start the conversation with you because you're leading so many collaborations uh, with communities and agencies at all levels of government. Um, can you speak to the importance of having more collaborative approaches when it comes to emergency preparedness and how, how do we achieve this? 
Thanks, Francesca. There's multiple benefits from collaboration. Like what we're talking about, our, our communities from Yale to Semiamu to Squamish, or from the town of Hope to Tawasin to Squamish, you know, however you describe it, it's, it's a geographical footprint, right? And there's a lot of different folks here in, in, in that geographical footprint. There's our 31 communities that historically are a part of the Coast Salish nation. So we, are, we all share family, heritage, spirituality, three different dialects of our language. There's 29 local governments in the area. There's all kinds of other, other folks like service providers, BC Hydro, Fortis Gas, there's farmers and everybody. And the, the, the intent of our collaboration is to create a, a few different alignments, Francesca. Well, one is to come to a deep understanding that irregardless if you believe in climate change or not, there's significant weather events that are impacting all of us one way or another. There's some mechanisms and levers that are coming into play, like the Supreme Court of Canada decision in Chilcotin 2014 that says we as First Nations have title to additional territories and we don't have to go to court to prove it. There's the Sendai Framework and Disaster Risk Reduction, which is really climate oriented more about preparedness than response it's really shifting the paradigm from one of the current situation of you know wait till something happens and do the best you can to respond to something that's more proactive and in sendai it calls for a whole society approach so we're building a collaboration with our our mainland coast sales communities with local governments with folks like farmers and service advisors to, to create some alignment with the declaration with, with supreme court with sendai I come up with a common strategy because without collaboration, we're all competing against inadequate funding where we're doing things to to look after or protect what what our priorities are, but and but compounding the effects downstream from us. So collaboration gives us an opportunity to educate everybody on what the climate risks are. Well, what are what are the new risk methodologies required to respond to, to climate risk, and to, to, to together move both orders of government so that they better align with their priorities. Quite often, Francesca, the, the funding streams provincially and federally don't align with our local priorities. So by coming together with such a large force of governments, First Nations, and individuals, hopefully we'll have some sway in how how we're funded. To, to look after things in a more resilient fashion, to use nature-based solutions over dikes and protection, those kind of things. So it's, it's all of those and more, Francesca. But I think it's a really good starting point that we have a really diverse conversation so that ultimately we build a plan that we all contribute into. We may not all get our way, but we'll all be heard and we'll be able to share that information amongst each other in those collaborative forums. Great. Thanks, Taya. It sounds like... It's so important to be on the same page from the starting point of if we're going to be involving so many groups that are being affected by this. Um, and uh, my next question, I'm just going to turn it to Tarina, who's worked in emergency management uh, for over 15 years in many different capacities. And, and you know, you've had to collaborate across. Uh, you've seen what happens in Alberta and in BC as well. Um, and then you, from a personal perspective, uh, also you and your family were evacuees. And I'm, you know, taking taking it from that bigger perspective, I'm wondering, Tarina, if you can uh share on an individual level, what are what are some of the key things that people should know about being evacuated? Yeah, it's um it, it's a stressful experience, no matter how prepared you are, and everything you know going into your own evacuation is almost out the window when you realize that the disaster you might have been prepared for if you were prepared at all doesn't necessarily match the disaster you're experiencing and how you planned your your preparedness kit or who the stuff in the kit is built for if there were key take homes i would recommend that everybody has their insurance agency uh, programmed into their phone contact list and their policy number saved in the notes of that contact, I would want to know what um, what my policy covers for evacuation coverage and how I activate that when I have to leave. I, I now still sleep with my car keys on my nightstand. There will never be a day that I don't have my keys somewhere close to my body. Uh, when we evacuated the REOC in Fort McMurray, my operational car keys had been taken with my laptop and cell phone by someone who had very similar keys, laptop and cell phone. So. Those are our key pieces. And if you work in the EM space or you happen to be a first responder, it's important to know that your family is ready and capable of taking care of themselves in your absence. If you are the one who will likely be called upon to help, it, you cannot, can absolutely not um, 
mistake the value of having a scanned copy of your identification saved in your email subfolders. Email, take a picture of them and email it to yourself. And um, knowing what the system is that sends emergency alerts or what each of your local governments that you operate in or First Nations use for their alert system, because especially in our shared complex landscape, we often live, work, recreate all in different geographies that may have a very different patchwork approach to notification. And one I really like to, to leverage is thinking about the good old school days where we had a landline that had a curly cord on the wall and you could reach around the corner. Whose phone number do you actually know these days? Everybody should at least know one actual phone number that they can call and give a message to say, I am safe and I have gone to this place or I need help and I am at this place. And uh, I think about our digital era now with kids learning how to press a button on a phone, not plug in a phone number and simple, simple things with children. Help your children know that your mom and dad or your parents or guardian have a legal first and last name. So if ever they're separated from you, uh, someone from an official response can help you link back to whoever they need to, to be linked to. Right. Thank you so much, Trina. Tarina, I remember in one of our conversations, like kind of having a, oh, of course, moment when you were explaining that, you know, you're, as you're, you're commuting through so many different regions and municipalities and districts, and they might all have different ways of alerting uh, people about possible evacuations or hazards in that area. And so if you're not aware of how to get those alerts in different uh, regions, you might miss something. So, um, I mean, it kind of, goes back to the importance of what Tyrone spoke to at the beginning there about like having greater collaboration between uh, regions. Um, thank you. I wanted to uh, bring Michelle into the conversation um, who, you know, was, um, was living in Lytton during the 2021 fire. It made international headlines, um, you know, but it's one of many towns and communities that have been almost completely destroyed by wildfires. And we're hearing more and more stories like this. Um, Michelle, can you can you talk to some of the best practices that you've seen that have allowed evacuees and survivors to share their stories and, and why it's important? Well, in terms of um, best practices, there's there's a lot that I can say about lit and exposing kind of what didn't work so well. <laughs> um, so if you could clarify the question a little bit for me, do you want to, do you want me to speak to the emergency response or, or how we get our stories out? Because I see uh, two different streams. Yeah. What, why don't we start with emergency response, what your experience was like um, through that? Okay. okay. The, the, we didn't get an evacuation alert. We had 20 minutes. And I think one of the points that I wanted to raise about uh, telling our stories is somehow if by telling the stories, we can get through that little piece of denial that we have advance warning. Um, I'm now living in a town that was evacuated in 2017, um, everyone here. So I would say that the conversations here are a little bit different because they're a lot more grounded in reality in terms of what to be prepared for. I was sitting in my front yard with my neighbor the other day in a helicopter with a big bucket of water went over and there was a moment of knowing and are we ready are we prepared i don't know if that specifically addresses your best practices but i do think the uh, elimination of denial of the fact that climate change is here extreme weather events are here they're not in the future and they're happening to your neighbor <laughs> they've happened to your neighbor across the street so that would be my point and like you mentioned there, you're in Williams Lake now, which in 2017 yes. experienced a, a major evacuation of wildfires yeah. and um, losses. Mm -mm. And and just yeah, starting from a place of of recognizing also the experience of of your neighbors and communities and and the expertise that that is within communities um, mm -hmm. to help prepare as well as as respond to disasters. I might add, my family is in Fort St. John. My mother and my sister. And uh, just two weeks ago, I was on the phone with them, advising them how to pack a go bag. <laughs> and wow. so, yeah, northeastern part of the, the province is on fire. So again, to my point around denial, it's here now, it's your neighbors, it's the people you know that are affected. And telling our stories, I think that's the only motivation that 
Um, at least for me, I don't know, I can't speak to other people's motivations for wanting to tell their story. But if there is some way to help, maybe the only thing I've got is a voice. <laughs> and if someone is willing to listen with respect, and allow me the space, I, you know, this has come up before to allow people the space to actually talk about the reality of the, of the uh, evacuation, and the reality of the, the fleeing and the finding of resources. I, th I think that's ahead of the game right there. Now, again, you'll have to remind me if I've covered the second half of your question. <laughs> that, that's sure right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we'll have lots. We're going to, we're going to keep chatting and I'm going to, this is my good reminder to folks that if you have questions, uh, put them in the Q and A, we're going to make some time to ask, uh, questions. And, uh, I look forward to, to seeing some of those questions in there. You should see something at the bottom of your screen where you can, put in some questions and, uh, and we'll be able to have a discussion with everyone. Um, but thank you, Michelle. And, and, and uh, Michelle, as I mentioned, is, is one of 11 uh, disaster survivors who shared their personal stories of evacuations and, and offered a lot of lessons for what's to come in uh, collaboration with the Taiyi and the Climate Disaster Project. And we'll publish a link to Michelle's story as well as many others who, who opened up their homes and, and uh, stories with us. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask uh, Susan, who is um, joining us from just outside of Paradise, California, and you're kind of going off of that discussion about community. Um, you've been involved with so many community groups that are still working to rebuild uh, the community after the 2018 fire there. And um, there was something that you shared with us previously when we were chatting about this discussion about the importance of building community before a disaster hits. Um, can you share a little bit about why you think that's important to make those connections now, not just, you know, after a fire or flood or evacuation? Mm, yeah, yeah. I, I, first of all, I wanted to just note that Paradise and Butte Valley, where I'm living now, are um, unceded Concow Maidu and Machupta Maidu territory, and um, and we are uh, we, you know very respectful of um, the teachings of of those um, cultures, especially with regard to fire. Um, and so I'll get back to that. But I wanted to just say, yeah, um, um, the community organizations that I was involved with before the fire became incredibly important. I was mostly, most of my energy was with um, uh, services to unhoused people. And suddenly, suddenly on November 8th, 2018, we were all unhoused. We were all homeless. And, and, um, and so um, just having had that experience um, and, and, um, and knowing what that felt like became very important to people to understand, you know, uh, what it means to have to survive on a day to day basis. Um, but I think the most important community organization that I was involved with before the fire, the, the one that became the most important after the fire was a group called Paradise Community Guilds. Um, and we weren't we weren't anything about, you know, evacuation or or um, or uh, emergency response or anything. We had community gardens that we facilitated. We um, we had uh, singer songwriter concerts come to our hall and and we did wellness events, you know, um, uh, but after the fire. The, immediately, we all connected. We all called each other to find out if we were okay, and we got permission to use the um, the Chico Guild Hall, which is the town down right, right down the the ridge from um, uh, the big city uh, next to Paradise. And uh, we got permission to use their hall to meet in, and um, and we met the day after the fire, and then we continued to meet um, daily for the first week or two after the fire, and then weekly for the next year and a half. And we made it a space where it wasn't just us; it was a place where we got out the word that we were meeting regularly, and people could come and let us know, you know, what they needed. Uh, you know, people came and said, "I need gas money," you know, to get to this RV that I know about up in Reading, and, and you know, we would take. A collection give them gas money or um and and people came to us too because we they knew that we were meeting and that we were all um uh, survivors of the fire people would come to us with things like you know this is what we learned from our fire about insurance this is what you can expect this is what you should do this is what you should avoid or you know these are materials you can start to think about to rebuild with you know that you might not know about and make a presentation on that or one person came from japan and had gone through the triple disaster um, in Japan of the tsunami and earth, the earthquake tsunami and the um, nuclear um, uh, disaster and and said you know this is this is what we this is what we learned 
you know, there. And and um, and uh, this is what you can expect in your in your in your recovery. So it's just really important to have those those relationships already in place so that we could hit the ground running in a sense of you know being able to organize, meet, support each other, and provide a place for other people to um, to plug in um, because your community, the places you met is gone and so you need you need a place and you need a way to do that so that's why that was really important for us yeah thank you susan and and we heard so um so often from folks who had been evacuated that it was the you know the the kindness of, of strangers and nearby communities and the connections that they had with family members or friends or or other communities that really helped them through so um it sounds like it was a similar experience for you as well yeah, Francesca, it was mind blowing how how wonderful people. I've been I've been quoting this this film called Starman, where uh, the alien in Starman says humans are at their best when things are at their worst, and we experienced that so much. And, and I, I'm I'm sorry for everything that um, you all, you have all gone through um, in in disasters. That, but I think it also is um, there there are silver linings all over the place. Thank you. So you're gonna have to add alien uh, film Starman to the reading list that we're, we'll, we'll share. Um, and uh, to kind of, I guess we were talking kind of broadly about, um, you know, the, the bef before, before uh, a flood or fire. Um, I want to bring it back to Tyrone and ask, uh, you know, we've, we were, uh, we just highlighted in this brief conversation about like all the different groups that are involved in mitigation and preparation, you know, provincial and federal agencies as well, um, municipal governments, regional districts, but how, how can smaller towns and, and First Nations and communities advocate to ensure that, you know, their expertise at the community level is, is seriously taken into account and that they have a meaningful role in the decision making? But this is some of the, the ideas we come up with so far, Francesca, is speaking to some equity or some parity across the region that includes you know large centers and smaller communities like ours. And if you think about critical infrastructure on a regional basis, that we all benefit. It doesn't matter if you're a large city or a small community. If you think about local essential services like hospitals and fire halls and those kind of things, again, it, it speaks to equity, right? And, and the one piece I missed in my open comments, Francesca, is the inclusion inclusion of the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So take Article 29, for example, where we, we as First Nations have a right to protect our land and resources. Uh, when we're talking about protecting and, and you put in the component of Sendai that speaks to build back better, there's a lot of alignment between our interests and local government's interests. I, I know local governments are really frustrated if a four foot culvert gets blown out, they get funded to put a four foot culvert back in place. So when we create a, a commonness and some allies between us as First Nations and local governments, and especially the, the smaller local governments and regional districts, they're really underfunded, right? Small, really small tax base. So they're a little bit closer to our reality of never having the human and financial capacity to do what it is that we want. But when you bring the, our small communities, the small local governments in with the larger communities, larger local governments, and have a common conversation, you're actually able to harmonize some of the ideas and concepts and coming back to support that that regional approach again too. I very much appreciating. We have a, a lot to, to learn together between mainland Coast Salish communities and the 29 local governments and how do we implement the declaration in, in our local reality? How, how do we create alignment between what it is local governments are intending to do over the next 50 years in comparison to First Nations where we've never had the ability to plan out for 50 years? So we can actually learn off of local governments in those processes as well. So if you, I'm a, I always promote Francesca that individually we have very limited capacity. Collectively, we've got tremendous capacity. So look for some cross learning, some cross cultural learning between us and local governments and and others living in our territories here, so that the it brings in that Sendai's whole society approach. So that we, we're all heard, we're all participatory, we're all contributing, and in, in one way or another. And most importantly, we're all learning together. We have some new space to figure out and implement the declaration, which in in some aspects is scalable from a small community and a small footprint to multiple communities and in a large geographical space. And it's an opportunity to bring everybody along in a, in a way that, you know, we have a common vision. 
uh, we, we have co common interests that we want to look after. But, you know, we we, we as First Nations, as Stalo or Coast Salish, would promote nature-based solutions. And a part of that is educating others and what that is and coming to a bit of a rub with local governments so they might want to develop in high-risk flood areas. And we're going to go, no, yet. we'd really encourage you not to because you're not certainly not going to receive our consent because we're not interested in putting more dikes, more st restrictions up to the, to the main stem of the Fraser and tributaries coming into the into the main stem of the Fraser. So lots of opportunities for great parity and equity. How it is you want to describe it, Francesca, that puts us on a, on a if not the same page, very much a similar page. And uh, how do we learn together? Uh, how, how do we support each other knowing that when one community or local government does something, others are impacted? Mm, and it sounds like if, if we don't have those uh, connections and collaborations or, or lines of communication open early where it's bound to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. Absolutely. It allows us to incorporate Sendai into what I describe as a more appropriate context, Francesca, because too often right now, the provincial and federal governments to say that the first pillar of emergency management is mitigation. Uh, the first priority of Sendai is understand the risk. And then the, the one I key on as well is the second priority of Sendai is is building a new governance structure around understanding the risk. So you can't mitigate until you understand the risk of this climate crisis that we're in now or whatever it is you want to describe it. So we need a deeper understanding from decision makers to those that are directly impacted by the decisions and what that risk is, what is it, what is it evolving into, and how, how do we all become educated on what that new risk methodology is, is going to impact us, whether I'm a farmer, a business owner, or an emergency health service provider or a, a Coast Salish community, it, it all impacts us, but it impacts us a little bit differently. Opportunities Great. to learn. Thank you, Tyrone. And I just, uh, what you mentioned there about being aware of the risk at the community level, um, Tarina, I'm wondering if maybe you can speak to like on an individual level or, you know, neighborhood level, um, how can people learn about the risks that might be in their areas? a really great question. Um, it's what I wanted to bounce back to from, from the being prepared piece. And I was hoping to have an opportunity to nail that message home a little bit. Hazards are everywhere, especially in the landscape that we occupy. And if you think about the settlement behaviors of Canada, there are waterways where people settled alongside and there are natural phenomena where the water rises, the water recedes. We live in landscapes where we build at the toe of mountainous slopes that land slide down. We live in river valleys where the water is carving the mountain terrain. We live in areas of hazard. And so often we have a systemic belief that the land is controllable and that the phenomena and behavior of the land is something that we can engineer, engineer around and keep in a human engineered design. And so when you start looking at things a little bit differently, some local governments publicize their hazard information. Some have map portals, some have um, geohazard libraries that you could get to know. It's important to know the hazard landscape that you live in and be prepared for that hazard landscape. When we look at the history of development, we have communities that have hundreds to thousands of people in, in neighborhoods that have one way out. And there's this belief that we're going to start paving new roadways when people choose to live in these neighborhoods. And Ty had mentioned that we have these complex shared landscapes and, and very important collaborative efforts, but we don't all have the power to pave more roadways. And so it's really important to know the limitations that also intersect with the hazards that you live in and make sure that you understand the messaging around first responder services and around your government or your local authority or whatever that structure is that you live within is going to help is really important when I look back on Michelle's comments to understand the reality of what we live in. A massive component of Canada is rural, undeveloped lands, people live off the grid, people live in areas where they don't have mailing addresses. If we look at our first responder services, um, the American NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, did a Canadian profile in 2014 to 2016. 
less than 5% of Canadian fire departments are paid staff departments. When we look at um, the dichotomy of service provisions that exist in local government areas versus First Nation areas, many local government cities, municipalities have urban fire services. Many First Nations don't have fire services right in their neighborhood. And so when we look at the disparity of how we have access to first responder services, it, it's vastly different from neighborhood to neighborhood, community to community. And so this, this message that, that continues to be asserted that someone is going to show up and help you is vastly different than the reality that you are going to be there to help yourself and you need to be ready and capable and able of helping your neighbors because we don't all have a first responder service that is there. And if we do many places across Canada, it is a volunteer service of your neighbors that help neighbors. They may be equally impacted by a disaster. And I really wanna emphasize that a disaster by its very default means that the societal structures that maintain our society are beyond their capacity. And so this belief that during a disaster, someone shows up to help, is completely awry from the definition of disaster. And we need to become more personally accountable to prepare on how we keep ourselves safe in those environments and how we help our neighbors when those issues arise in our communities. It's so important that we look at preparedness and risk mitigation through a lens of community resiliency. Thanks, Trina. It seems like a lot of folks in the chat were have a lot of ideas as well to share from what you um, just talked us through. And I know Michelle, you know, someone who's most recently gone through and uh, gone through an evacuation. Did you want to add um, some thoughts to that? Well, I wanted to describe an interaction that I had right after I moved here because I moved to the city in the fall and the little house that I bought backs onto a green space and the weeds were up to my waist. So I called the city guy, the guy in charge of city safety. And I said, I figured I still had a little bit of credibility coming from Lytton <laughs> that I know my fuels. And uh, we had a really good conversation. He was receptive, he was great. And then he said to me, Michelle, you're right. We don't have staff and we don't have money. And this is a town that was evacuated in 2017. So they're not fools, they know but there is no infrastructure and there is no way. So I said to him, well, I'm going to water my lawn back there and I'm going to be talking to the neighbors. And he said, sure, that sounds like a plan to me. Um, and that's just one example, a very small example, but it's a daily life example. And certainly it has, <laughs> I've been watering my lawn back at the back of the lot because the weeds are up to my waist again. So thank you. Thanks, Michelle. And, and uh, since um, you were talking about Kind of more the like on the ground practical things. Um, I'm 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 wondering maybe we can shift the conversation a little bit into the response and recovery. Um, and I'm hoping you can speak. To, what are some of the practical things that you think uh, need to be addressed to help disaster uh, survivors and evacuees in the immediate aftermath? I know you know as a retired mental health nurse, mm -hmm. um, you know were there enough mental health supports for the community? Maybe you can speak to some of those resources. Well, in a word, no. Um, and again, I can use a very practical example around this. We all know there, there's there. I listened to a, a psychiatrist who special specializes in disaster psychiatry not too long ago on on the radio. Um, we know what happens after a disaster. People are traumatized. They can't sleep. In terms of um, support getting a physician to get you on a little bit of assistance for anxiety, uh, sleep, uh, getting the appetite back, all of that sort of thing, that could have been, that that's something that could be done. And I, there are models that can do that. It just hasn't been looked at. Um, to be honest with you, and I really hate saying this, but I've heard this over and over, Facebook, it's one of the few places that you can have real-time conversations and everybody's got their phones, or at least most people had their phones. And so there were all these informal gatherings that happened. Um, on one occasion, a, a young family who has English as a second language, someone put out the word, they were evacuated to Kamloops, they put out the word and said, so-and-so is, is in Chilliwack, 
can anybody help these guys? They've got the days wrong. They don't know where to go. So a group of us end up in a parking lot emptying out our pockets. So language. Um, communication was was just very, very difficult, partly very understandable, you know, as as Tarina was saying, the whole province, the, the fire didn't end with lit and it carried on and, and went through the entire province. It was massive. So um, it's understandable that things have to catch up, have to catch up. Um, actually, but I did want to illustrate something that worked really, really well in a little bit later aftermath that doesn't get talked about a whole heck of a lot. At a certain point in the post-fire phase, people started to talk about the animals that they lost and the wildlife that was lost. And there was this grief. Um, and anyhow, so we arranged an animal memorial. Now, because everybody scattered, not that many people were able to come. But the response, again, through Facebook mostly and emails and the rest, to get the names of the pets and the names of the farm animals, um, to be provided was was an amazing response. And I've been told multiple times that it helped. It actually helped because it was an acknowledgement of um, something that one could do in a, in a really hopeless, helpless kind of situation. Um, I could go on. <laughs> I don't know that I should. I don't want to hog any time. Some things worked very well. The kindness of strangers is a theme and the kindness, those wonderful ESS volunteers, I could hug them all, even when they could, couldn't give me anything. You know, I was given a bottle of water because I was insured and I didn't qualify for anything much. Um, so some things worked very well. And at the very same time, there are massive gaps. The mental health piece is hardly explored in my experience. The, when I directly requested assistance for some trauma symptoms that I was having, I got a list of email resources that I could have picked up off of Google, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, I, you know, we end up solving our own problems and gathering as friends and community to support one another and do the best we can. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's certainly what I wanted to say. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to unmute there, but I was just, I was just responding to say, absolutely, I think, we heard so so much uh, from yourself and other folks that just even just having a space, a shared space where people can come together and grieve and and find that community, share their story. And and um, I saw Susan, you know, smiling uh, at at your responses there from the corner of the Zoom screen. And I'm wondering, um, maybe Susan, you you might be able to to share some of your experience. And and also, I know um, one of the things that you highlighted is that you know the the Paradise Fire was in 2018. People were really um, had a lot of energy maybe at the beginning, but what has that been like now, almost five years later? What what are how are people feeling, and what how do you keep that energy going to to rebuild? Mm. Yeah, but, um, before I answer that question, I just want to you know um, underscore what Trina was saying about you know your your community and your friends and neighbors being the first responders, and and, and I you know on the on the day of our fire things fell apart really quickly. The wind was blowing so hard that um, we, we were prepared. We went to an emergency preparedness workshop two weeks before the fire. We had a plan in place for the whole town. It fell apart in the first like hour and a half of the fire, um, just because um, the you know the nobody anticipated that the water would run out. The pipes melted, and 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 there was no water. Um, the first responders became more. It, um, focused on evacuating people and saving lives than putting out the fire, which, you know, that wasn't, you know, wasn't anticipated. Just a lot of things fell apart. The people who helped the most were the people that were around, you know, that, that, that were, that, that, went to their friends and neighbors, made sure they got out, made sure that, you know, that everybody knew there was a fire and 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 what the plan for evacuation, you know, um, had had changed to. And so um, so we Paradise Community Guilds, the nonprofit I talked about before, we have a our vision statement is be the community you want to live in. And I would say, be the community you want to evacuate with too. <laughs> you know, um, so just to pick up on on uh, what you were saying, though, that now that um, uh, and, and you know, just really also to pick up on what Ty was saying, collaboration, you know, is just is is so important. Um, it, I say beforehand, yeah, plug into your various community organizations and 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 be a part of your community. Um, 
Community organizations have a tendency to be siloed though. And so realize that soon after the fire, it's a good idea to try to start to pool your energies, to collaborate with other organizations because um, uh, it, 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 recovery is a marathon. <laughs> it's not a sprint. And everybody wants to sprint to start to get back things back to the way they were. And so, so, um, so the, the, the burnout is a, a huge issue. People um, uh, are dropping like flies here right now because you know we're we're four and a half years into into our um, recovery, and um, the people who have been sprinting for the last four and a half years are really depleted. And so, um, the, the the best thing I think we learned is to start to pool our resources, start to collaborate with each other, and and you know identify common goals and um, and and use that energy to um, to you know set priorities. And, and, um, and so that, that's, that I think is my, my response to, um, you know, how, how to avoid the, the, the problem that we're having now how, is, is to really support each other in pacing yourselves, you know, and, and, um, and, and pulling resources. For example, we have an organization called um, Patch. It's a Paradise Arts Theater and Culture Hub. And it was a, a group of arts et, and theater groups that all, uh, lost their well not all of them but most of them lost their buildings and they realized at one point that build trying to build back themselves with like most of the people having scattered and a lot of other people having you know you know people rebuilding their own house and stuff building back the theater building back the arts center building back the you know the all those things was going to be impossible with um you know with just the people that were left so they came together as a collaboration and they're going to build one art center in, in paradise and that's going to serve all of those groups. So, you know, that's just an example of the kind of collaboration I think that's really important to avoid the inevitable depletion. <laughs> well, that's a, sounds like a, a really like tangible example of how bringing together folks can, and then create another space where, you know, Again, like Michelle said, coming bringing together folks to to share and experience an art center sounds like an important part of of the recovery process. Um, and we kind of touched on a little bit about the uh, volunteers that are often at the front lines of uh, these responses. Um, you know, it might surprise some folks to to learn that you know the the people at maybe some of the centers where evacuees first arrive, those are all volunteers, volunteer run, um, and um, Tarina, I was wondering if you might be able to speak to um, one of one of the examples that you shared in in our conversation about spontaneous volunteers. Would you, uh, as a as a possible solution to help kind of, you know, address um, the need to have bigger and bigger responses to some of the some of the larger evacuations that we're seeing in our province? Yeah, for sure. Um, most disaster research shows that spontaneous cooperation exists and occurs in the disaster space. Often we invest a lot of time and effort into pre-screening, training, affiliating volunteers, making sure that they are ready to go when we need them. And the reality about the pre-screened, pre-trained, or pre-trained, pre-screened volunteers is often that they're not available or that they're equally impacted. And so recognizing that spontaneous cooperation does occur, looking at some of these resiliency networks becomes invaluable where they might, there might be bodies of or organization where people know and trust one another and could integrate and connect, link with official response. Um, as long as the legwork is done up front to ensure that there is a trusted communication pathway and you understand the authorities, accountabilities, and responsibilities of what each partner, such as official response and community response, are capable of doing, empowered to do, and how to do it without duplicating efforts, stepping on one, of a, one another's toes, or creating new situations of danger that can put yourselves in jeopardy or first responders in additional jeopardy is invaluable. And so I, I really emphasize the importance of community resiliency networks. And that's a, a component that our program is moving in as well, because we can't necessarily, we can, we don't need to necessarily control volunteerism. We need to honor how it happens and find ways to integrate that into official response. Again, emphasizing that reality of disaster. We know we need allies and partners, but we don't necessarily need to train with them every single day, all day, 
We need to be able to integrate them. We need to be able to identify the opportunities and pathways, and we need to be able to figure out what the gaps might be in, in incorporating them. And some of our communities that don't actually have fire protection, we're really envisioning how a neighborhood network that already exists might be able to be a part of official response and directly bring information through our trusted channel to our emergency operations center and push information out among their own community network because there can't be assumed a first responder agency to do it in those areas. And as we again factor in limited egress and access communities, sometimes there are just challenges to getting people to places to share a message. So looking at the authorities, accountabilities and responsibilities of what official response, official responders do, what your local emergency management program is, can do and has plans for and identifying the gaps will allow us to work as a collaborative and figure out what the critical gaps are in disasters that can be escalated to those first responder agencies or your EMO emergency management organization and really connect the dots without the extra duplication. We can't control disasters, but we can figure out how to operate effectively with them. Yeah, thank you, Tarina. I think that is a message we've heard a lot about, you know, trying to control disasters or there's so many parts of this that are out of our control, but what what is what what planning and mitigation can be done ahead of time, even to react in the moment. Um, Michelle, I see, I'm going to turn it to you. I see your hand is up. I want to put a plug in for the uh, local rep around uh, for the TNRD, the Thompson Nicola Regional District around Lytton, because it's been two years in a row that they've lost homes on first it was the 21 fire, then it was the 22 fire. And she's been working very, very hard because the second, the second set of fires, it was local response. And they're, they're work, working very hard to try to come up with exactly what you described. There's no fire uh, station over there. There's local people that know where they live. They know their land, they know their, their, their properties, and they're, they're working very hard to create local resources because again, fully aware that we're not going to get rescued necessarily, or it may take days or it may just go. And two years in a row is kind of a good lesson, I would say. So I'm really hoping that the, there's success with this. I have no power over it other than I, I really am impressed at the local grassroots level and people have to include everyone, every community. Um, you just, you can't do it. It's like a three-legged stool missing a, one of the legs. So good work. <laughs> Well, to, to to your to your point about local grassroots um, movements, I, I'm just going to turn to some of the, some of the questions that I'm seeing in the chat here, um, and I'm just reminding everybody to to put your questions in there, and we'll uh, we're going to start turning to them now. Um, and um, Michelle, as you were you know bringing highlighting other groups, um, it looks like Janet Hudgens um, is asking you know beyond government, um, what are some of the experts who who are some of the experts who are the folks that we should be in, involved in this um conversation uh i'll read their question um is there some other body um other than government that could take climate change in the hands uh to take climate change and uh address it in in a, in a, i will say quote because government have failed completely um so what are some what are some ways that people can turn to other bodies if they're feeling that maybe uh, in that if they're feeling that they get interviewed by the media <laughs> <laughs> and they try to do it from a place of advocacy. Um, no, none of my compatriots have ever expected to be interviewed. I never thought I'd be talking about my underpants on CBC radio. <laughs> um, and hey, it's worth it if it if it connects with somebody. You know, then that and that to explain was talking about what you throw in your go bag. Please put something that you like in your go bag because you might not be coming home to anything. And there I was stuck with an ill fitting bra, you know, and here I go again talking about my underwear on uh, in an open forum. But that's, I think. <laughs> That's what comes to mind because beyond that, it's helplessness. It, it's a feeling of helplessness. So anything that you can do to deal with that, that sense of helpless frustration, I think is a good start. You've got informal community leaders. There are always the, the, the people who know everything in a community that might not be officially affiliated with anything. 
um, those are the people that start to agitate <laughs> and quite frankly, get rolling. And I'm speaking in generalities, but I, that's what I'm seeing. Women in my circle of friends that would never have dreamed that they were running for office um, and have. Um, again, you know, people who would never, who I feel like I've got nothing but a voice, really, you know, in terms of I've been on survival mode for the last two years, we're still kind of in the middle of, we're not even in the in the rebuild phase, we're not, I would say we're not even to be fair through the recovery phase by any stretch. Um, our burnout phase is probably looming <laughs> for all the all the people. Um, so I can't really answer with specific organizations. Thank you for the question, though. Yeah. Does anyone else want to respond to Janet? I think Susan and Trina maybe looks like you're. We, we have learned so much from the Indigenous peoples here about fire. Fire has been a part of our region, you know, for tens of thousands of years. And, and the Indigenous people have, have, you know, have been caretaking, you know, um, this this environment for that long. And so they have been invaluable in teaching Thankfully, now, um, you know, the fire, the first responders and the, um, the, the government agencies are, are starting to listen um, to, you know, how to um, how to do fire mitigation in a in a forested landscape, you know, how to um, how, how to replant native um, trees and plants that are resistant to fire. The indigenous people have this this knowledge and and, um, and are sharing with us. And and finally, I think um, people are starting to listen. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Tarina, did you, I couldn't tell if you were unmuting or not. Tyrone, uh, did you want to add anything to like what groups we should be looking to or, or if, if you feel like you want to pressure your, your, any agencies, how do you do that? Well, just th thinking of some of Michelle's comments where the, the, the supports were there, that's not our reality, Francesca. There's, uh, a lot of the service providers have no idea who we are. They really seriously lack cultural competency. There's racism, rears this ugly head on occasion. So uh, a piece of that is, in our plan is to move away from the, the current ESS methodology to something that's a little bit more, more holistic. That, that that speaks to him humanitarian aid as opposed to you know local short term service supports and take diet for example thinking of some of my relatives that have been out at Lytton and they're they're forced to go to Denny's three times a, a day for the same meal you know for months at end where that you know our model will be building in our, our traditional foods or our traditional ways of looking after each other's mental and physical health and whatnot and advance things that way so. And, and I think to that end, Francesca, I, I would argue that our response to a, a, a completely revamped ESS model will better serve anybody, everybody. Certainly we'll focus on our, our diet, our heritage, our family relations and whatnot, but there's a lot of other folks out there that have common values, common interests, right? So we could be a lever point to make some significant changes there. And, but um, but but maybe if I could, Francesca, is a bit of a reality check for everybody that just because you're a, a, a well-known service provider, national or international, when it comes to our communities, that really doesn't mean a heck of a lot. You, you mm -hmm. don't know us. You you might think you're doing a great job, but in reality, you're not when it comes to our values, our worldview, our family relations. So we will use two different tools and mechanisms like the Declaration or Jurisprudence to, you know, to, to kind of sober folks up. And better described than what what are how how you as a service provider need to do business to meet our needs, as opposed to running stuff you know canned programs and supports off the shelf that are based on other people's worldviews and values and interests, not ours. We'll be fixing that, Francesca. And um, Ty, maybe you can speak a little bit too, because the right now the the government is looking at modernizing this process. Um, are you able to to talk a little bit about? what you've seen from that process and if there's anything that you're seeing that's bringing you a hope for the future or things that you're still pushing for as as the government kind of modernizing modernizes the uh how how emergencies are handled uh, i'm really alarmed at the the current process francesca I, I've only heard Minister Ma speak to the, the first priority of emergency management is understanding the risk. Everybody else in the system says mitigation, mitigation, mitigation. And, you know, so the, the bureaucracy hasn't changed its tune. Certainly the, the, the province politically has, but the bureaucracy hasn't. 
So uh, my communities have directed me not to sign a non-disclosure agreement, which you're compelled to, to actually see the draft legislation. So that, that alarms me, Francesca. How can you be transparent if you need to sign an NDA to, to review something? And should I, should I have signed the NDA, I can't then communicate back to my 31 chiefs, for example, which is, you know, it's going in the wrong direction. We need, we need new innovative thought and in how we're included. And it, it really begs the question that if the bureaucracy is still thinking of the old way of emergency management, how is that going to play out in a modernized emergency program act? And most importantly, how is that emergency program act modernization going to achieve the free power and informed consent of Coast Salish communities and, and other First Nations throughout the province? And even in that, Francesca, I, I would put it on the table that, you know, we, we want to impress our worldview, our values, our priorities in EPA modernization. And I assure you that local governments and other folks like farmers and ranchers and all those folks, they're going to want to do that too. But there's a barrier there with an NDA. So it's I see a huge potential for harm, a huge potential for moving backwards in EPA modernization just because how it's rolling out. I really encourage the province and, and governments to look at things differently, do business differently, be more transparent, be more engaging than the old consultation process. Listen to us, take that whole of society approach that Sendai described so eloquently and look at it from a, a proactive risk management um, perspective as opposed to, you know, you bury your head in the sand, wait for an event, a flood or a wildfire, then you jump awake, you've got all kinds of assets and resources to throw after the fact. But we, we need to move away from that, Francesca. It's done too much harm, not only to us as humans, but the, our non-human relations through our ter ter territories. The very forests themselves, forest practices, need to change to prevent these, the size and scope of these wildfires and its impact on floods. There's so much forest in BC burnt that it's increasing the severity and risk of floods. So it's all combined, right? And and from what I'm hearing of the EPA, my last comment there, Francesca, I'm aware of a couple of people that are on Public Emergency Program Act modernization calls, but there's only 30 people on the call, and 15 of them were EMCR officials, and only four First Nations were represented on those calls. So it, it certainly doesn't meet my, my test of coming anywhere close to free for informed consent. I just hope it doesn't do as much harm as it potentially could by not including voices such as mine. Um, and Ty, I think like what you were what you were speaking to there was actually flows into one of the questions from the Q and A here. So I'll just uh, since you're on the topic, is that um, so? B. Servando asks, what are the implications of land restoration movements and indigenous sovereignty in empowering environmentally marginalized individuals and subverting anti-climate change rhetoric in the context of climate refugees? So just in terms of, you you did speak a little bit to this already, but if there was anything you wanted to add, um, the, the implications of land restoration um, and, you know, addressing some of the, some of the anti- climate change rhetoric that exists? Uh, I think one ability that we can bring to the table, Francesca, is, is putting everything to the table. T too often the, the, the province has blinders on, they're doing this, the federal government has blinders on, they're doing that. Well, if you look at the flood response in a, in a proactive way here in, in the lower Fraser River, I put on the table the national disaster um, sorry, the climate adaptation strategy. Or in that strategy, it calls for biodiversity, space for biodiversity. Well, for me, that's wetlands, riparian areas. It provides uh, the resourcing to, to purchase those lands to ensure that they remain in a natural st state rather than being developed, right? It, it calls for, uh, it, it's not explicit enough in the strategy yet, but I put it on the table. Well, what are the, the carbon advantage advantages of keeping wetlands and riparian areas around uh, carbon sink, carbon sequestration, you know, those kind of things. And you put put on the table as well the, the National Climate Emergency Management Strategy. I, I like that strategy, Francesca. I just don't see it being applied locally. So, uh, again, you got a, a federal, federal political movement that's better responding to Sendai, better responding to climate crisis, better responding to climate adaptation prior to events than, than after events, but it hasn't hit the ground. That's, that's why I really want to build a force here so that we're telling both provincial and federal governments, quite frankly, I don't care what you're currently funding. This is what we need you to fund. 
in a regional approach that takes a, as much of a whole as society. We ca I can't really engage the, the three and a half million people here in my territory, Francesca, but I can engage sectors of them so that everybody's heard, everybody's felt. And, you know, we, we build out something that sounds so that in the end, I, 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 I argue and maintain every step of the way, Francesca, we, we have some hard decisions to make. So some dikes are simply too close together. They have to be moved back. But who better to make those hard decisions than those those of us directly impacted? And if we do put anybody in harm's way, how do we collectively look after them? Especially if they're farmers, you know, food security is critical. We can't leave them alone. We need to build in mechanisms that support them because they're supporting us. And by putting them at a little bit more risk, they're saving a whole lot of other folks from, from uh, the, the same severity of, of risk, right? Which lowers their response over time. So a big piece of it is educating folks. And you, you hear it from time to time that, you know, a, 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 a dollar put in proactivity saves seven to $32, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 years from now. Well, let's take advantage of that and do things more more proactively in a regional basis that takes on a, a, a an approach that that aligns with all these provincial and federal initiatives that are completely disjointed right now, and it, it's nonsensical in this day and age, Francesca, that both provincial and federal governments are just casting money out there, and you know you compete for it, and it doesn't fully meet your priorities, but it's the only funding available, so you have to do try to do the best you can. Well, let's be strategic. Let's bring people together and harmonize our voices and priorities. And I, I argue that you know the, it increases the likelihood of us getting what we actually need, as opposed to conforming to certain funding streams. Great, thank you so much, Tyrone, for that um, response. And I just also wanted to just give a, a little bit of a shout out to Tarina, who's answering questions in the Q and A, um, typing them in. So if you're wondering where maybe some of your questions have have gone, she. She's answered them as well. And so there's some some really good um, questions about, you know, uh, on an individual level about insurance claims and, and how to do that and some tips. So um, I'd encourage you as well, if you're in the chat to hit answered and you'll be able to see some um, some of the questions that have been answered as well. Um, there is a question from um, Sebastian uh, that I wanted to put to whoever wants to answer, but the question reads, uh, I am a member of a, of a quote, climate action team at my housing co-op, uh, and I'm wondering what your suggestions would be about the most effective ways to build our community's resilience to future disasters. So uh, it's a housing co-op, um, and uh, they're on a climate action team. What are some of the ways to build uh, commu their community's resistance to future disasters? Does anybody want to start? Well, I would just say, I would go back to the, you know, sort of being the community you want to live in. I would, I would suggest connecting the dots for people. And it's so, it's so important, I think, to, um, to, to make sure that people understand the, the connections between climate change and the disasters that are happening and being, you know, and listening to the testimony of the people that, you know, that have gone through the disasters and then connecting it back to, you know, that, you know, that um, what we know about uh, the climate changing. I, I think that um, what, uh, I mean, I, I was, I was teaching a course in the philosophy of global issues the semester that we had the fire. And I was still myself thinking of climate change as a future problem. In my mind, somehow it hadn't really hit yet, <laughs> you know? And then it came and burned down my town. And that was the first time I realized, oh my God, it's here. This is, this is it, right? And I think it's just really important and it's, it may seem obvious, but I think it's just really important to make sure that people, that, to, to underscore the connections between these things. And, and, and just like Tyrone is saying, it's, you know, we, we're not just saving the wetlands to save the wetlands. We're not just, you know, um, building soil to build soil. It's sequestering carbon. It's part of the solution. You know, so connecting those dots for people, I think is really important. Mm, the, the why behind all the actions that your, your group is doing. Yeah. One, one of the uh, issues that we've run into is this whole business of how do you rebuild in a clean way? And here's me, here's the ideal, and there is no clear path for me to go from here to here in terms of if I want to retrofit this shack that I bought, if I want to do anything with this shack, I actually don't really know how unless I was wealthy. So there's there's this huge disconnect with what's good to do and how to get there if you've got the resources to get there. Um, so if there's a way, I second 
educate, educate, connect the dots, connect the dots, point it out in, in a way that engages your very local community. Because those will be the people that if something happens, those will be the people you're working with. And it, it, it does have an effect. I, I've been complacent um, up until a number of years ago. Um, and it's, 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 once you get to know who your local politicians are, you kind of realize that, wait a minute, you can, you can start to insist mm. and vote appropriately, and you know, appropriately, whatever the word is. Um, but yes, just engage. <laughs> it's time to engage. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. It sounds like like this have put bringing together something like a climate action team for a housing co-op, as Sebastian's asking about, is is a good way to bring together uh, folks who maybe have similar questions to you know how do you, how do we close that gap that you're you were um, just describing. Um, Tyrone, did you did you want to add your hands up there? Just quickly, Francesca, I think that folks should need to learn to understand how how risk is changing. If you look at governments, they they tend to change their predict or model or predictive models off of like 100 or 150 years of historical environmental data, whereas insurers and reinsurers are only looking at the last five to seven years. So as a housing co-op, start to understand what is the the the, the increased severity and in, increased risk of events such as floods, wildfires, hailstorms, tornadoes, hurricanes, anything in your locality. Just to give you a better awareness, because you know you have to get ready to leave under some circumstances, then at least you have a better idea of what time of the year and what when are you most prepared. And then going back to the earlier comments around what what is your car, carbon reduction plan? Because in in order for us to have meaningful change to the climate, that it, it starts at the individual level, right? Uh, how do you reduce your carbon footprint, whether you're going for carbon neutral, carbon zero, or carbon negative evenly? So uh, it's all new lingo to us, right? But in, in order to better support our grandkids, we're all going to have to get a, a grip on it, regardless of what age or what generation we're currently in. Car carbon is going to be more and more of common language going forward. So the sooner we drink that tea, the sooner we can respond to it. Thanks so much, Tyrone. Um, that kind of leads us to to another question that I uh, that was put in the chat here from Francis um, Deverell. Apologies if I have mispronounced your name. Um, but, you know, should we be, their, their question is, should we be trying to get things back to quote normal uh, to the way they were? Or is it possible to stop in the middle of this disaster and say, what should we change? How would we like to be? Can we build it uh, less car centric, for example? So Ty, you're point about carbon footprint and cars kind of led me to Francis's question. Um, does anybody want to start to answer that one? Do we, should we bring things back to quote normal as they were? And how do we kind of shift our collective priorities? Tarina. Uh, a really great question, series of questions, and has a lot of dialogue and debate. Um, depending on which hat you're wearing and what kind of uh, neighborhood structure you reside in. Um, I, a notable highlight for me recently was the Government of Canada news release that identified that Canada has now reached 40 million in population. And in comparison, we finally supersede the population of the state of California. So <laughs> we're vastly different in our build in Canada. And I think, Francis, you're probably familiar with the 15-minute cities concept and the importance of finding ways to stay local and reduce our, our footprint on the environment. Fantastic. Great idea. So invaluable in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And yet we struggle to bring that to life when so many people across our great nation live and work in vastly different geographies where public transit isn't available because it's left to small local organizations to figure it out on narrow tax bases. Or you don't work within a reasonable proximity to your day job where you can earn an income. And some of these developments still will build you a, an idealized structure where you theoretically might be able to find a job, but the job that you find is not going to be the job that earns you the salary necessary to work and live in those compounded structures. So there's a lot that needs to go into the planning and development realm to look at how we reduce these pieces. And again, I think that some of the solutions really do boil down to enabling more fluidity in our grant funding mechanisms that we apply for. So that when we're sitting here looking through the lens of 
emergency management, preparedness, climate adaptation. We're not just applying for grants that can help us build our response capacity. We might be able to apply for grants based on our local need to empower more opportunities that naturally reduce our footprint on the planet. And something beyond probably most of our control in this audience is the simplicity of, of very, very tactical, practical things. Like we look at end user regulations where no longer can we drink out of a plastic straw that might come with the plastic cup, but we don't have national regulations that change the food production, food packaging that is still manufactured using greenhouse gas emissions, industrial machinery and equipment. And still every purchased item in a grocery store comes wrapped in plastic in a box and then more plastic. I sometimes am infuriated by the quantity of bags and bags and bags, and yet we can't have a plastic straw. And I'm totally happy with my silicone alternative, but maybe we could actually look at higher level regulatory in impacts that will change our, our national contributions to our planet and stop thinking about it as someone else's problem to solve. It's not just your planet, it's my planet. And I've taught my kids from very, very young, don't litter on my planet, take care of my planet, take care of our water. We all need to become more accountable in that. Um, that doesn't answer your question intimately on the uh, 15 minute cities concept, but yeah, if I could bike to work every day, I absolutely would. And I think many Canadians would, but so many of us don't live in the same proximity to the job where we work. And maybe many of us don't have a high enough income or a reasonable salary that matches the workplace that we would live in and work if we found the job opportunity locally. So there's a lot that needs to be done in the social sector and in planning sectors to bring those opportunities to reality. Yeah, I think I, you likely hit on a frustration that many people have in terms of the balancing the individual, what do I do? But, you know, there's these bigger systems at play. How do we get both of uh, everybody closer together to the same alignment. Um, and I just wanted to repeat one of the things that you said about, because it was a, a solution to one of those, uh, to that kind of challenge is that having more flexible grant applications and the idea of like tapping into the knowledge that already exists and letting, letting, uh, letting communities guide those solutions. Um, Tyrone, I'll turn it to you. I, I think a piece involved there, Francesca, is a, a deeper understanding of resilience. You know, we can be resilient in terms of being conscious of our carbon footprint and whatnot, but what are what other opportunities could we put on the table? For example, in, in our strategy, when we get down to the level of detail, that would probably best respond to this, Francesca, that we'd be pushing for any building, say, with a, a 10,000 square foot roof has to be green. There, there needs to be more green landscape in city and town designs. There, there needs to be no, more permeable parking lots in, in these buildings and facilities, right? To, to allow mo more water to, to, sink, to, to be absorbed into the earth rather than trying to manage the surface water, particularly during a pluvial event. So it, it, it is carbon and, and carbon reduction, but from, from a you know a personal 15-minute walk, absolutely. But what else can we do? And even speaking to like heating and cooling systems, it's we need to put all of that on the table and figure what can we do first because we know everything has to be done at, at at some point or another at some level or another. What can we do first? What is our personal? What is our our industry? What is our our sector's response to it? And work that way because for me, to for an effective flood strategy here in the Lower Fraser Valley, is it's going to speak to green roofs. It's going to speak to open ditches and waterways that are thriving with salmon that are biodiverse. Yet at the same time, shedding water off of farmers' fields so they can produce the food that we rely on. Right. So the, I think the, the piece I'm getting to here, Francesca, is that rather than just having a flood strategy and then a, a climate strategy and something else over here, we put them all together, create some synergy, some effectiveness, some collaboration between varying priorities at varying levels of individual to, to governments, and we start doing it. That, that's the piece that's missing right now, is that proactive nature of doing things in advance as opposed to sitting in the desk and waiting for an event to happen. Susan, did you want to add something? Well, so I wanted to say that even at the very local le level, you know, there's there are the very strong hegemonic forces that um, that you know want to just put everything back the way it was. We want to rebuild paradise the way it was. Everybody, you know, there's a lot. There's a strong, and I'll just give you an example that we had a group 
called the, um, it's now called Campfire Collaborative. It started out as a long-term recovery group. It was just a wonderful group of, of you know, local organizations and churches and uh, everybody that wanted to be involved in the, in the, in the recovery. And um, uh, they started meeting immediately after the fire. And the first meeting that I went to, um, I was listening to the housing committee report and they said, oh, good news. Paradise Lumber Mill is, is going to, you know, get right started up again so that we can start using some of this burnt wood, you know, to rebuild the town. And I said, I, wait a minute, we're going to rebuild with lumber? And there was a quiet, and I said, has, has anybody thought of the implications of that? And there was this nervous titter, you know, <laughs> and I said, I guess I'm going to have to join the housing committee, which I did. And I have made, been making an effort to try to bring um, alternative building materials into the mix of, you know, the rebuild. I'll tell you what, it's really, really difficult because nobody, uh, all the contractors that come to town to help you rebuild, don't, they, 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 you know, are, are going to do it the way they've always done it. They are not familiar with new building technologies and to go out and find people who are willing to come in and um, and, and, you know, set up shop and, and teach us how to do alternative forms of building has been very, very difficult. We're starting to be able to get some of that done now, but it has taken quite an effort and quite a long time to, um, to just, just, you know, switch that paradigm, even when people acknowledge you know, that that would be better, that would be better for the climate change took us down. Let's not contribute to climate change, you know, in the way that we rebuild. That's a very, very basic message that we're still trying to get across. Thank you, Susan. M Michelle, uh, did you want to add some? Thoughts? I just want to say, Susan, you said it. And, and it coexists with that gap between how to get from here to here. And there's a, another issue that, that, the rebuild, the money that's been slotted for the rebuild of the little village is all committed. It has to be spent in a particular way, which means that the people that can afford to build back in that particular way cut out most of who used to live there, at least in the, in the houses that are gone. Um, my neighborhood in Lytton was seniors on a fixed income in older little houses that are not going to be able to put the money up front to, to build it back the way it's been mandated. And that is kind of talked about, but it's a little bit of an elephant in the room. And then that wanting to build it back the way it was, my impression is that that's part of the grief. That's the grieving. And that, the, you know, as people come out of that, and that's part of the moving on. It's never going to be what it was. And in 10 years, boy, won't it be interesting to go have a cup of coffee in the new coffee shop there, you know, and that's what brings up the sorrow and, and the long-term grief and nothing to be done for that, except I, I, I texted the, the current mayor not too long ago. And I said to her, um, from where I sit, what I need to do personally is live my life move on, wish Lytton well, wish it recovery, wish it well, and cherish the people. And I know those are great motherhood statements, and they're going to be different for everybody. But that's where we are. And we're, and we're still grieving. And that's part of it. And thank you, you articulate, you've all been articulating things so well. Um, it's been quite something to, to sit and listen here. Michelle, thank you so much for sharing that. And um, I'm, uh, you know, echoing what Michelle has said in, in terms of what's been shared today, we only have a few minutes left. Um, and I was hoping maybe we could just end um, if if you're comfortable sharing. We've talked about, you know, in the context of all of this, it can feel um, very daunting to take this on, but you've also shared a lot of hope for folks. And I'm maybe hoping we can you can share something that is bringing you hope as you work and live and work through these these spaces um, is there, what is bringing you hope and what would you like to share that uh, with, with us as, as we kind of move from this conversation? Is there a solution, a moment, um, something that is bringing you hope in this conversation of, of addressing climate disasters? Yeah, paradise has become a better community as a result of this. this we, have, we, we have this shared experience that has bonded us 
in a way that um, I would have um, never imagined. And, and um, I'm glad you bring up grief, Michelle, because um, if part of it is just learning how to grieve together. Grief, grief is the flip side of love. You, you only really grieve what you really loved. You know, oh, and, oh my God, that's so beautiful. <laughs> that's an important thing to remember. Thank you, if I could add quickly, Francesca, what recently you hope is a, a session I had two weeks ago where we had local governments and First Nations and 58 other different organizations come together, have a common discussion. And you should have heard how loud the discussion was, Francesca. Everybody was engaged and it made me feel really good because that level of participation, I feel really strongly that when we release the plan, everybody's going to see themselves reflected because they've all contributed. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sharon. And I think, um, at least for me, one of the things that has, has brought me a lot of hope is working th working on this series and hearing a lot of the stories of of people who have survived, people who are who are bringing light to this issue continually. Um, just thank you so much for for taking the time to do that and and sharing your personal experiences as your uh, as well as your uh, experiences working towards solutions. Um, that has brought me a lot of hope. Um, Checking in to see if anyone else wants to share anything before I, I wrap it up. Tarina. Figure out your hazards and find a way to be flexible and adaptable. Um, my own lived experience, staying in responses while my family evacuates without me has helped me to understand that all of my best planning can still not be what is needed in the minute. And thinking about what is the reality what, what are the realities? I'm, I'm gonna join Michelle in the underwear campaign, have a bag somewhere and know that if you evacuate, it might be four days before you get to find a clean pair. That bag can be the difference between your own mental and physical well-being or not. It sounds so silly and it's just so, so utterly practical. Um, my closing notes, I would say, if there are things in your life that are absolutely irreplaceable, know where they are and keep them close together. When I ran back into my own home with a police uh, escort to gather my pets and to get what I needed, the things that I grabbed were my pendant that has my dad's ashes, the quilts that my mother made for my sons, um, my husband's Xbox, which had a hard drive that had all of our family photos on it. They're very practical things because everything else is replaceable. The irreplaceable are the things that you will regret having scattered in different places in your house. Uh, fire smart your property fire smart fire smart fire smart which has a different title in the united states but um same principle applies the more we do as independent people and as collective neighborhoods to reduce our wildfire risk the better and that goes with considering green landscaping natural plants that exist in our specific geographies using plant-based prevention and at the end of the day be adaptable and be flexible and recognize that when a bad thing happens, everybody is doing their damnedest to help somehow or another. Everybody is beyond a circumstance that they have lived through in most cases and beyond what their typical experience is. And every single one of us is a human. We're all going to do the best we can. So recognize when others are beyond their capacity and figure out how you step in and help. Thank, thank you, you so much, Tarina. Thank you for that. Michelle, uh, did you want to share one, one final thought I'll be from quick. today? I'll be quick. It's, a, it's an obligation on my part to, be, to remind everyone that if you're going to believe in despair, to be honest with yourself, you also have to believe in compassion, and you also have to believe that good is just as strong as despair. So there's not much point in hanging on to despair. Keep up keep plodding along. Anyhow, thanks. <laughs> That's it. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm, I'm so happy that we're leaving it on that, on these thoughts that you've all shared um, of compassion, recognizing the folks are, are working hard towards this. And um, just thank you again to all our incredible speakers, uh, to each of you, Tarina, Michelle, Tyrone, Susan, thank you so much. Um, thank you to everyone who who joined. And I see the, the chat was uh, 
so engaging there and as, as were the questions um, to the partners who made this event possible, uh, the TAI, the Climate Disaster Project, and SFU Public Square. Thank you so much. If you're interested in, in sharing your story with, with us, um, there are links on the TAI's website as well as the Climate Disaster Project. And um, thank you so much for the engaging questions. If you missed any part of this, you can. there'll be a recording available later. Um, but I hope you were all able to take some things away from this conversation and um, just wishing everyone a safe summer ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Friends. Thanks. Take care.